Gruz, I now have to switch to English because our next speaker is uh, Marco Marquez, who is about to appear here. Hello, hi, Marco. Hello, everybody. A warm nice to you. welcome from Gruzpo and uh, uh, I'd say from Milan. And I know that you are, we are heading to Vienna virtually <laughs> at least. Exactly. Welcome to Vienna. <laughs> Marco is uh, working in Kong and he specializes uh, in the API space. So kind of uh, machine to machine communication is uh, it's right. This is kind of specialization, but uh, it's human that's programmed the machine. So I expect uh, some surprises in your talk. So uh, it's live. Marco will be presenting live. He will have a demo. So I cross a finger for you. <laughs> and uh, I'm here. If you need something, uh, if you need uh, anything, uh, just ping me and I will Perfect. pop up with you. Perfect. All the best uh, for your talk. Uh, its uh, name is Building a Fully Automated CI, Continuous Integration, and CD, Continuous Delivery, process to administer your API lifecycle. Your mic. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, Thank you all um, for being here. Um, like um, you mentioned, essentially, my name is Marco Marquez. I'm a solutions architect here at Kong, um, an Italian company uh, with Italian founders, and I'm happy to be uh, speaking to the Italian audience. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the topic that you guys have been hearing about, though in a different language. Um, this time is going to be in English, and it's going to be focused mainly on the ability to automate the release of an API. Um, in your organization. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll first start with the problem. So what is it that the problem um, that we're trying to solve is going to be addressing? And then actually show you a quick demo on how is it that we solve this problem, right? So um, very briefly, the agenda, we're gonna start first with how is it that um, you know we run into these problems that involve the automation, oh, sorry, the lack of automation and how is it that these automations can essentially help? Um, how is it that the benefit will be for each of these stakeholders that are all um, related to the API lifecycle? And how is it that using the product that I represent, Kong, essentially, how is it that we'll be able to do it? And finally, do a quick demonstration of this. Okay. Finally, we'll do it and uh, we'll finish in a Q&A. I would imagine that this is going to be taking us between 30 and 35 minutes with the exclusion of the Q&A. The Q&A will be an additional 10 to 15 minutes, depending on um, the how quick or how slow we are. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. First, I want to talk about the problem. So when I was um, part of the engineering team, one of the things that would always happen when it came to pressure was essentially something that started with this. It started with the discovery. Okay. So that meant that um, we had to create a specific um, solution and this solution required engineering. So my team to scope the feasibility of this solution. OK, the customer requested something and we needed to look into how expensive and how long it would take. Now, our engineering, most of the time, our engineering team, our manager would go in, scope it. After we would scope it, they would go ahead and put up a timeline, say, well, you know, we go ahead and need, I don't know, three weeks. Um, then our project manager would take this uh, estimate and then add an additional week to make sure that we would have enough time to deliver this. OK, so after we had that target release, we would share the release with the consumer, the customer, essentially. And what would end up happening is that we would commit our code. Um, a lot of times we would rush it into it. And we would have perhaps some errors in there. We had some mistakes. And these mistakes would be handed off to our operations team to, let's say, deliver. Maybe if we had a SaaS platform, a SaaS platform, in my case, it was the case, we would have that. And what would happen is that we would have to patch that request right after. So after we actually released it, within a week, we had to patch something, which would, at the end of the day, have a response for the customer that would decrease the confidence in our product. Okay, 
And then eventually the customer response was obviously not that great, right? They, they, their customer confidence would decline. And from our side, what we would end up doing is saying, well, for the next time, we will pad even more. We will have an additional week that we add as a you know, Q&A test, okay? So what ended up happening is that we increased the padding per cycle so that it would include more and more time. And then on top of that, the customer would the customer confidence would potentially decrease unless we have this really huge padding that would allow us to not predict or control what we had. So once we multiply this by having a lot of customers and a lot of features, you end up with you know this kind of up and down uh, configuration that we want to avoid, where we struggle with predictability and the customers um, ex kind of experience is not as great, right? So why is it that we have this problem, okay? In the 90s, what would happen is that um, you had everything centralized. You had a monolithic, you had a big, big server, and what would happen is that the big applications or big companies would eat the small, okay? Then Docker came around and, um, you know, speed was the name of the game. So the fast became eating the slow. And now being big was actually not something that was very important or very good. It was actually something that perhaps was not so great. Now we are actually now in the connectivity or resilient um, life where what that means is that now we want to be connected and we want to make sure that we deploy things the way that they are meant to be deployed with a lot less errors, right? And that, that is kind of the, the goal that everybody has. But when you take into consideration different parameters, it's actually harder than it sounds. So let's take a look at why is it that it's hard, okay? Why is it that it's hard to deliver something that is right essentially the first time around? First time, first thing is consistency. You want to be able to do things in a consistent manner with whatever you can control, obviously, across many teams. So you may have a big organization and you want to make sure that you accomplish the same thing with each of these teams and with the same process and the same output. OK, ideally, you want the speed um, to be obviously um, as quick as possible so that it runs the tools that you use run as fast as you are running. OK, you want it to be secured, right? You have a lot of teams, you have a distributed ecosystem. We need to make sure that it is something that we do um, in a secure fashion. And finally, um, we want it to be flexible. We want it to handle not only that big um, 1990s monolith or that speedy Docker Kubernetes environment, but also everything in between so that we are able to integrate everything. That is essentially what we want to do. So um, let's go ahead and talk about you know, the problems of each of these models. Okay. When we're talking about a decentralized um, life, okay, which is something that we probably all of us have, what ends up happening is that we have an API platform, okay? And imagine that we all, all these teams want to create their own APIs, okay? And we want to provide autonomy to these teams. We want to provide them the ability to be free and develop the APIs that they wish. So as we can see here, dev team one goes in, and is able to input um, API, a, any API into the platform, right? But they have their own standards. They have their own specific standards. Dev team two does the same and sends also the request with their own standards. Dev team, team N will do the same. So here we have provided an autonomous way of working for each of the teams. So speed is very good. But the problem is that as an organization, as a solutions architect, you want to make sure that you have these standards. And that's something that we would struggle with with this model. So if we go with this model, you struggle with that. Then we have a centralized way, which is a way for us to avoid any error. So here we gather speed. But here what we end up doing is that we say, OK, Dev Team 1 will go in to a centralized point, And then Dev Team 2 as well. Dev Team N will do that as well. And they will all use best practice because we will have to review until it complies. So we have guaranteed standards. We have said everybody that sends an API needs to be authenticated, needs to provide metrics, needs to provide everything that we have in our company. So everything is centralized with a central IT or a central API platform team, which gives us the standards 
The problem is that we now have a team that is in the critical path. And that is obviously a concern because we're not as fast, okay? What happens when we have um, something different, something that we call API ops, okay? Where we are going to be using a CI CD flow to set certain standards, but at the same time, provide the ability to our teams to have that ability to run as fast as they can. So what that means is this, is that we will have perhaps an API platform team still, okay? But this platform team, rather than doing the reviews, let's say manually, or doing the reviews in a way that is not automated, will set certain configuration or rules at the CI CD level so that whenever a dev team wants to push a change, will it will have to go through that platform team and have to go through these number of steps that will be essentially validated um, by that tool, by that CI CD integration, so that the platform team is met with um, those rules essentially. So that's something that we will be able to accomplish with API ops. The result is obviously that we have a speed, a speedy process, and we also keep the standards because those are going to be happening at the CI CD rather than having, let's say, some manual process or perhaps somebody going in and looking at the APIs line by line, um, which is not going to be ideal. Okay. So what are the benefits? The benefits obviously are going to be that you have a higher speed, meaning that you have the full automation of a full delivery pipeline that enables every team that you have within your organization to operate and scale faster. Again, because there is no dependency on a specific team to approve these. It is going to be a process that is set by that team so that that process is an automated, is very public, and everybody knows. Okay. Obviously, that means that you have higher quality because now you have the standards that are outlined. You also have a very repetitive process. So one of the things that we talked about was the consistency. So things will be consistent and the checks will be essentially always the same. And if you, for example, miss a check, you'll be able to modify the process so that in the future, anybody that tries to make a modification will have to go through that process again. Okay. And finally, it's going to be lower cost. When you automate things that used to be manual, Obviously, that means that you, respect, you will reduce the spend that you have on your QA team. So currently, a lot of teams spend around, a lot of um, organizations, there was this report that essentially said that around 22% of the IT budget is really allocated towards making sure that development that is done is done in a, in a way that actually you know, it meets the standards of that company. So spent on QA, essentially. So we want to minimize that by automating things that are done manually, okay? Overall, this means that you innovate more with less, okay? And that is really the end of the goal. At the end of the day, a business is either making more money by selling more or you're saving costs by reducing the amount of um, effort that you put in to do the same things, right? So let's talk about um, the teams, okay? Let's say that we are sold on this, but we want to sell it internally. Let's take a look at the different personas of that involve the release of an API um, in an automated fashion and whether the, the feedback is positive or negative. So a developer, okay? I used to be a developer. So as a developer, I wanted to have a faster deployment. I didn't want anybody to get in the way um, for me to actually release my, my new development, okay? I wanted to release all of that. And if it stopped by any, by any, for whatever reason, it would lead into frustration um, and it wouldn't be fun. So obviously I can tell you that as a developer, having that process be outlined, be public and be essentially given to me as an automated fashion is really good. Now, an operator, right? So let's say that an operator, somebody who actually manages these API um, platform team and wants to operate, well, by having automated configurations, you have faster, smoother deployments. You also have the Q&A that it's automated. You have fewer errors, better stability, shorter outages. So that makes you look really good, obviously. 
because you want to have the highest uptime that you can. And then as a solutions architect, so the position that I am right now, essentially we want to make sure that we have a faster time to market, meaning essentially get our developers to develop the code and pass through our pipes as quick as possible with having a better reliability and reuse. So having the ability to re reuse this code and having a reliable tool. And then finally, obviously to have the automated security. So have these rules that are completely automated so that we can make sure that the risk is as low as it can be and we are compliant with whatever is it that we that we are set up to do okay so perfect now let's talk a little bit we understand the problem we understand to some degree the solution how is it that this works in calm okay if you're not familiar calm essentially is going to be an api management tool what that means is that when we're talking about apis and as we go through that API lifecycle, we need to make sure that Kong is going to be, let's say, from the time that you build an API all the way until you publish that API, okay? So let's go ahead and divide these um, segments into what Kong will be able to do and what products we'll be able to use. So um, we're gonna hear a couple of products and if you have used Kong and its applications that surround Kong, this may be a little bit of a review, but I'll very quickly go through them and kind of show you in the demo, all of these. So we're gonna have GitOps, which is going to be essentially a CI CD pipeline. It could be GitHub, it could be code deploy, it could be any Jenkins, it could be really any of these tools that you use. Then we're gonna use a, a product called Insomnia, which focuses on the development of these APIs and the creation of an open API spec um, with its command line brother, which is going to be Inso, which is going to be a command line application that plays hand in hand with Insomnia, except that Insomnia is going to be focused on the GUI and Inso is going to be focused on the CLI and the CI CD. And finally, we're going to use a different tool called DEC, which is going to stand for declarative configuration for Kong that is going to be the ability for us to translate that open API spec over to a declarative configuration that will then be ingested by Kong, okay? So let me show you a little bit more about what is it that I'm about to show you guys, okay, in a demo. So it all starts with the design of an open API spec, okay? Um, I hope that the majority of you guys have heard of um, an API lifecycle or full life cycle, okay? Um, it all starts commonly with the design of an open API spec. What that means is that you create a Swagger file or you create a YAML or um, JSON file. Either of these actually are the ones that you will create. And commonly our customers start by creating it in a tool like an IDE, um, like Insomnia, okay? So imagine that we wanna create an open API spec first design approach. Once we do that, you have this open API spec that you use a tool like Insomnia to lint, to test, and to enforce certain rules that you put in this one file, the open API spec, so that then you can take this open API spec and pass it over to the testing stage, okay? Perhaps mocking on the way, right? You may want to mock the actual open API spec so that the backend doesn't um, exist, but the open API spec contains um, sample responses and the gateway is able to respond to that to them. You then pass it over to the actual management of that API, meaning the creation of the API connections. In this case, is going to be in Kong and then pass it over to the, um, the portal, the publishing. So when we look at those steps, we have the main design, which can be in Insomnia, it can be in visual code, it can be in VIM, it can be in any of these tools. Once that happens, you pass them over to a source control, okay? And this is something that a developer does essentially every day. They make a, an actual modification to a certain code that goes over to GitHub for then GitHub to then handle the rest and go through the essential API workflow. In my case, I'm gonna have a PR, okay, a pull request. This pull request will integrate with Inso. So Inso is gonna be, like I mentioned before, the CLI, tool, the CLI tool for Insomnia, meaning that we are gonna have this open API spec be converted 
into um, a, a file that Kong will understand. Okay, for lack of a better word, that's what's essentially going to happen. We're going to generate this uh, declarative configuration. Once that happens, we're going to do some validation. We're going to check certain things to make sure that it's a valid thing. We're going to then merge it. Okay, let's say that we have tested it out. It passed our checks. It passed our tests. Once it passed our test, then we want to merge. Okay, and once we merge into our open API or open API spec into our GitHub repository, what I'm going to have, I'm going to have a GitHub action that then triggers an insert request to then push it over to the gateway, push it over to the developer portal. You could even push it over to different tools. Okay. So recapping what we are going to be um, doing right now, it's essentially going to be taking that open API spec that starts in insomnia as a GUI, then pass it over to GitHub. GitHub will have an actions that this actions will ingest the open API spec and then eventually pass it over across the CICD flow until it ends up in Kong. Okay. For this, you won't, for this demo, you won't need to know a ton about Kong, but um, it will be useful if you are familiar with Kong. So now that I have set the stage, let me go ahead and show you uh, my demo environment. Okay. And since I'm doing it live, let's see how it goes. So, all right, let's first start with Insomnia. Okay. So Insomnia, like I said before, is going to be a tool that we will be able to be using to have open API specs, okay? And if we go into one open API spec, I have a stock API, you will see that it looks something like this. And like I said before, the steps will be that we have the creation of this first. That's the, the way that we start with our APIs. We start with this, where we say, these are the paths that we have this is, for example, the description of that path, certain tags, certain requirements, certain parameters. And then um, here I have provided sample responses. OK, these sample responses are going to be used so that we at Kong can mock these responses. So if I then, let's say, look at this design and I say, you know what, this looks good. I like the way that this looks. I can go over to debug and I can make a call. And this call will be responded to, okay? This is going to be the response that I'm getting from here, okay? If you notice this, it says result data is Apple and it gives you the numbers and the numbers are there, okay? Perfect, we have mocked it. And that is because we are actually making a call to Kong, okay? This is where Kong lives. So this is going to be the API gateway responsible for it. In my case, uh, as you can see here, it responds to it. If I then put stock historical, I'll be able to hear, in this case, I, it doesn't respond because essentially it's not, I'm not sending a specific ticker, okay? Let's, let's not worry too much about that. What all we need to know is that in this URL, the localhost 8000, that is essentially where Kong lives, okay? Then we can then run tests, right? Again, all of this would be pre-pushing it to GitHub. So I have these tests that I then can run and make sure that they pass. Good, okay? This is a completed example that I have already done that essentially is having the mocking also in Kong. But what happens if I go to one that doesn't have it, okay? I have this, um, not stock one, this orders API, where again, I'm making a call to uh, port 8000 with the ID of one, okay? I'm going to go ahead and take a look first at the design of an open API spec. You'll see the open API spec. I also have certain responses, okay, as you can see here. If I then make a call, you'll see that it doesn't work. And that's because we haven't pushed it over to Kong. There hasn't been any change that we have said to Kong, hey, I want you to go ahead and uh, send this response. So let's go ahead and work on that, okay? So. If we go over to Kong, okay, and I'm going to go into the administrative part of Kong. This is the administration of Kong. I can go into my APIs. I can go into the routes. I can look at the stock one, the one that I was using, okay? And you can see why things are working because I have a mocking plugin. I have a policy that says I want you to mock based on that open API spec, okay? But the other one is not going to work if I were to search for 
order, v1 order, it's not going to be there. So I don't have it defined, and hence that is the, the problem. So let's say that we want to now go ahead and push this change, right? Well, I have a repo here, and I already cloned it into my environment here. Uh -huh. Let me actually not do this. So <clears throat> I have an environment here. Let me go into the one that has a little bit of a higher resolution. I have the clone here, okay? Kong Labs GitOps template. And in there, you'll see essentially the same thing. So now what happens if we, as a, as a customer, we want to then go in and let's say make a modification to our orders YAML. This orders YAML, just so that you're familiar with, it's essentially going to be the same orders YAML that you have here, okay? It's the same one. And in an ideal world, you could also map it to GitHub so that you would be able to commit, push, pull, like I have in my you know done example. But in my case, in this one, I don't have it. I essentially just have the stock API. And just to make it easy, what I will do, I will essentially modify it directly from GitHub, okay? Though, keep in mind that that's something that you would be able to also do from Visual Code if you wanted to. Again, I have it here, and you would be able to make modifications that would show up in your um, repo, okay? I'm not going to do that because I have some repos in there that I would rather currently keep um, confidential. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and do an easy test, okay? And if I go ahead and modify this, I go into the file. Let's imagine that we say, hey, we want to modify some of the policies that Kong is implementing, okay? So rather than having 75 calls per IP, which is going to be a rate limit that Kong implements, I want to go ahead and increase it to 100. So now I can go in and say, change um, rate limit from 75 RPS to 100 RPS, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and create a new branch. This is going to be going back to what I said before. We are going to be doing the pull request. So I go in and I do the pull request. I will propose it. Once I propose it, I can press create pull request, okay? By doing that, essentially, I'm triggering a certain action, okay? And before I show you what is happening, I'll show you the actions that I have. So based on this, you will see that I have a couple of actions, okay? Actually, it doesn't really do, do a really good job of showing the actions, but I will do that. I will show the actions. Um, if I go in here, I can look at the workflow file. And this workflow file tells me on a pull request on the branch master, I want you to do a couple of things. And like I said before, we're going to be using Insomnia to generate this and push this over to a YAML file. And then this YAML file is going to be used to validate with declarative configuration for Kong. Again, these tools that are going to be very useful as we implement the CI CD. In my case right now, I don't have my runner running. So let's go ahead and run it so that this actually takes place. I have it ready here. So let me go ahead and run this. Connecting to GitHub, it is going to be listening for a job. It's running now the generation of Kong config from spec and validation of the API. You can see here that this started working now. If I go in, it starts looking into it. And luckily for my demo, everything went well. I have the validation, it worked, and everything was successful. So that means that this passed the first check. So good, so far, so good. All right, so now we have the second step, right? The second step is now we're gonna merge it. That means that we, <clears throat> from our side, we have this PR, we're ready to merge it. And that is gonna be deploying it to the gateway and the portal. Because if we go over to the routes, you're gonna see that orders, it's still not there, okay? And in our developer portal, which I haven't shown you guys yet, you only have the stock, and I have another one that I haven't talked about that's called SIGUP Conference APIs and then stock API, okay? But what happens now if we merge it, okay? Let's go ahead and merge that request, and I'm gonna go ahead and confirm. So after I merge, we go over to Actions, okay? 
And now we see that merge pull request for. If I go in, I'll see a job that is going to be very similar to what we had before. And you see that it's doing a lot of things, okay? And everything at the end of the day worked, okay? So perfect, so far so good. Um, but let's let's go ahead and see what is it that happened. Well, we did the, the same things that we did before where we used the declarative configuration from spec, okay? We then validated it, but now we have additional steps. We now are gonna be deploying the declarative configuration where we create a couple of plugins, a couple of services and an upstream. So let's not get into too much into the detail of what this is, but essentially we deployed certain things. And in addition, what Kong actually did right now is that we took this file as the main, um, the main environment. So everything that is not included in there, it deleted. So it got rid of everything that is not in that open API spec, which is what we would expect. We would expect this file, this file, sorry, this file to be the source of truth. So in my case, the way that I have it configured is that I get rid of everything that doesn't match this. Hence, I put it so that it deletes everything, okay? So it deleted everything, and then I published it over to the developer portal just by using one call, okay? So perfect, let's now take a look at that. If I go in, you'll see that in my default, the services now only have the, um, the pizza order. I only have one route. I don't have any consumers and I have the two plugins that I have set up. Furthermore, if I go into edit, I'll see the 100, which is what I changed. If I then go into the developer portal and I refresh, you'll see now that I see the pizza order APIs. So that's good. What happens now if I go over to my um, pizza orders here? It all works. So now we have pushed and we've done essentially that whole flow in an automated fashion. And again, just to recap, what essentially we're doing with setting these rules to be created in an automatic in an automated way where you have these jobs that are going to be completely public that are going to essentially validate the things that you are pushing over to, um, to Kong to make sure that going back to the CI CD flow, everything is going to be standardized across the teams because the CI CD pipeline will extend across the teams. So at this point, um, I'm glad that my demo worked um, since I'm doing everything live. I'll stop here and see if you guys have any questions as far as I know, um, we have around 10 minutes to answer the questions. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen now. And uh, thank you guys for your time. Let's move on to some questions. Yeah, it was a great uh, demonstration. I loved it. I loved it. Good. I love some things that are actually showing the magic. It's looking like a magic. You Perfect. just commented uh, and then GitHub actions uh, and the workflow did, 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 did a trick. So um, it's, it's really interesting to see something of this kind because some things that we talk about the theory, uh, but then uh, it, it, it it's missing the link with the reality. Now that that's GitOps actually. I will say uh, we we watched it running. He, he committed. He git pushed it, and uh, actually something happened in the, uh, under the hood. Mm -hmm. So um, Marco, uh, yes. thanks again. Uh, I uh, would like to invite uh, every everyone who is still connected. Uh, it's quite few people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. No a lot of people, I'd say, uh, if uh, you have questions, to raise them in the chat of YouTube. Uh, we have like 10 minutes uh, or or less. Uh, I start if uh, why waiting for, yeah. for the, let's say, uh, audience people team mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. groups. OK, my first question is uh, um, uh, I, I was really, really, I really, really like the the, um, the the pipeline you showed, uh, the slide um, you had uh, with uh, with all the steps. So, uh, and uh, at in the center of the slides, uh, there was a big 
uh, box and it uh, was the PR, the pull request. Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, while you were telling about pull requests, uh, uh, in my mind, uh, it popped that that's, this is probably, as I had the feeling, that it's a very, very important step in the mm -hmm. flow. So yes. it's where the team gather and communicates and take some decisions, isn't yes. it? In mm -hmm. some kind of way. Okay, so how would you recommend to get there? I mean, how can I, as a team, as an organization, have a smooth and well and well-crafted, useful in terms of uh, under the light of GitOps uh, about pull requests? How yes. would you recommend to conduct it, to set yes. up a kind yes. of process? That's, that's, a, this kind that's of. a really good question. So what I would say is that it varies from customer to customer. Based on my experience, there's no right way or wrong way. It's really what works for you. So let me dive a little bit deeper into that. So some customers, let's say, for example, they use a GitLab process where you say, before you go ahead and put a, and do a pull request, I want you to have different steps, right? And you have some pre-pull request validation, okay? I, have, I work with other companies that are a lot smaller most of the time. And essentially, anybody within the, the development team can do a pull request. It's really about the merging that is a little bit you know, more sensitive, you could say. And if it's more sensitive, what that means is that it's an automated flow. So as they mature, what ends up happening, or as you grow and you have more teams, what I feel ends up happening is that you have more kind of checks between, let's say, the source control and PR, between insomnia and source control to get to that PR. And then you have another additional step to get into the merging of that. Right. So right. what I would say, and if you're in a younger stage, a lot of, I have met companies that essentially they do the merging manually. And um, that is something that I would discourage. That would be, I guess, the closer that I get to um, the wrong answer. Um, discourage the merging to be done in a non-automated fa fashion. That's just asking for trouble um, because you essentially are giving so much power to a specific person to potentially bring down your application. So definitely discourage that. Um, the other, the other kind of got how to get to PRs. It's really up to up to the company. Um, but my experience is that the bigger you are, the more barriers you have to pass through to get to the PR. You're right. Of course, of okay. course. Yes, it comes to processes that needs care. And exactly. they, after you got very well the process in your mind as as working your company you can mm -hmm. figure out from the process a tool and a standard isn't yes. it not the opposite uh, the, exactly uh, yes. we have the tool and the tool it's it's doing this kind of workflow and we do have to adapt the team no it's the opposite we mm -hmm. do exactly. have to map the process on the tool exactly. uh i do have some questions and uh, it, time is running so uh gabriele is asking and uh, it's uh, i i trying to expand a little bit uh, of the question insio yeah. is a price product product and uh, i add a little bit uh, more uh, to this question i ask you if uh, kong have an open source and enterprise version so about yeah. licenses and so on how, how can we use the tools yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, everything that I have shown you so far would be applicable to both the non-enterprise and the enterprise. The only thing is that the portal, for example, it's only available in the enterprise solution. So obviously that step of pushing the changes over to the developer portal would not function, okay? Simply because the actual module is disabled, not because Kong cannot do that. But um, everything else that I'm showing you essentially would work. Um, the whole CICD flow would work in both of our um, tools. Um, it is true that we have two different um, models. We have the open sourced um, solution that um, anybody would be able to use. Um, and also we have the enterprise, which will include things like the developer portal, things like the mocking that I just highlighted, but both of them would be compliant with any CICD demo that I did today. You can find it at konghq.com, that's our website. And if you are also interested with Insomnia, you essentially can go over to, oh, I should probably put uh, call or let's put API uh, and then Insomnia REST is going to be the website. 
you can go in and get started for free, um, which is something that you'll be able to also test it out yourself. Got it. It was Perfect. clear. Oh, uh, let's switch to the other two questions. I would like to to yes. to to have all of them. So, uh, very very briefly, this uh, we work even on AWS. Is asking Gabriele. That is a, that is correct. Any kind of CI CD should or work. In general clouds, uh, public yes, cloud. Yes, exactly. Yes, it should work. Yeah. In the very very last one, it's from Mickey. Is API Ops a good approach to test out also the microservice? Before having you to answer, uh, I I would like to share a, a, a personal thoughts so when you told about and when you demonstrated the um, oh sorry Insio uh, no sorry Insomnia the guy uh, it recalled me what it's uh, kind of. Uh, um, TDD, test-driven mm -hmm. design, behavior-driven design. So from a very uh, broad perspective, uh, it's uh, the customer test in some yes. ways. So mm -hmm. uh, back to the question, is a good approach uh, to test microservices? Yes. I owe you the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, definitely, definitely. I mean, testing anything when it comes to engineering is always good. I think that you will struggle to find anybody that says, no, don't test that. Um, but going further more, what I would say is that, I mean, testing tools that are maintaining your application, it's always going to be a good thing that you do. Um, what I would also add on top of that is to make sure that the automate, the, the, the tests are automated, are consistent, are public, and are very open to the developer. So they know what to expect and make sure that you, if for example, you miss something, you're able to say, well, let's go ahead and fix it for the next one and add an additional unit test, add an additional set of rules so that whenever there is a potential you know, problem, you will be able to capture it. So I would say that yes, testing is, um, it, it would be very beneficial if not required um, in my personal opinion. Um, it's something that I would highly, highly suggest, but take it even further than that, I would say that it should be automated, consistent, and ideally have it you know in a in a public forum so that it could be changed and modified and improved that's what i would say yeah both the, the way how we tested the tools how we test and also i would like to add uh, i don't know if you agree the interaction with the teams mm -hmm. i mean exactly. QA teams yeah. um, you have to if, if you are not in the situation where you are a cross functional team maybe you have to add professionals uh, to mm -hmm. be more cross-functional and get the problem in, in its big picture. Exactly. Yes, that's completely correct. I agree with that. Marco, uh, we are getting to the uh, uh, to the finish line mm -hmm. for today, yeah. and I would like to ask if you would like to add everything. And uh, last but not least, if you do have something to suggest, uh, like resources, books uh, to. Uh, to improve on the topics you mentioned in the talk. Yeah. In the talk. Yeah. What I would say is that in case you are interested in, let's say, seeing this live in your own organization, please let us know. You know, you can contact me. Essentially, my email is mmarques. I should actually. I'll just type it up oh, here. Oh yeah, we, we will publish it and then we will. <laughs> this essentially the, um, newsletter. You'll be able to Come contact out. me. Um, in case you're interested, I'm happy to help you guys out. Obviously, the guys from SIGUP have been are, are there locally. So in case you are interested in this and the API ops, definitely let us know. OK? Yeah. Perfect. Man, thanks a lot for no being so brave to demonstrate <laughs> something live. And again. Hey, hey that's uh, you, know, you, you only live once. It's, uh, it's worth to take risks sometimes. <laughs> we have to close them. So, Ciao Marco, thanks. Ciao, again. thank you.